Good evening, everyone. Um, welcome. Thank you all for being here. My name is Kathy Irving. I work at the Tatter Cover doing what I love. And it's my great privilege to present to you Marcia Sinatar, who has been an inspiration and a support to many people, myself among them, with her books, Ordinary People as Monks and Mystics, and Do What You Love, The Money Will Follow. Her brand new book, Elegant Choices, Healing Choices, continues her explorations and elucidations of traveling what has been called the path with a heart. I think you'll enjoy hearing her voice in person even more than through her writings. And I'm privileged to introduce her to you, Marcia Sinatar. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Kathy. Tattered Cover for sponsoring this. It's uh, sort of a first for all of us. And uh, thank you so much to you all for coming. This is the first time I've spoken to a balcony before. <laughs> if my mother could see this. <laughs> well. Just to introduce myself to you a little bit, for those of you that aren't familiar with my work, I have a small practice of organizational psychology and began my professional career as a teacher and taught for five, six years in Southern California. I became a school principal and spent about six years more with, uh, with Torrance and also with the California State Department of Education doing um, a large assortment of leadership and curriculum design work. Along about that time, it began to be clear to me that what I wanted to do was to write and to have a business practice. Uh, I hadn't a clue as to how I was going to do that. I had no business experience, um, essentially no family, and by that I mean no business connections. Uh, I did not and do not network in the, in the commonly understood meaning of the word, namely uh, go out and join clubs and so forth. And I'm giving you this little background so that you'll have a real sense of uh, where I have uh, come from the last six to eight years. I've been in practice now for about eight years and just uh, last year when Do What You Love started to take such a popular turn and it looked as if I was really over the, uh, the, 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 the hump, you know, uh, I thought to myself, what I, what I think I can do now is to really um, bore down, you know, really get into the writing. And so I'm cutting back on my business practice just a little bit. Someone asked me if I do uh, lectures like this, and I really don't. I, I might accept one lecture a month. It's, it's amazing to me, and I sort of wondered, I asked a few people over there, how many of you were dragged here kicking and screaming? Uh, you know, come on, honey, if you love me, you'll come to this thing. <laughs> but I'm going to assume that you came here to uh, hear about right livelihood. Uh, my purpose tonight, to come uh, to that purpose, is really to talk to you about uh, right livelihood more than about my book. Uh, my work over the last eight years and before that was usually and is still with the segment of the population that you would consider the top three percent. When I was teaching, I specialized in gifted students, uh, mentally gifted minors. When I was a school principal, our, our school district had a center for advanced studies for uh, bright kids and also a learning disabled center, early childhood center. That was all in our school. And we also did training for the University of Southern California. We taught teachers to teach. Um, when I opened my practice, much of what I was doing with the public sector 
leadership thrust I began to do in the industrial sector. Uh, and what I found is that regardless of age, cultural background, gender, socioeconomics, there seem to be some characteristics that knit certain people together. And those characteristics I began to describe in the book called Ordinary People as Monks and Mystics that was written primarily for spiritual directors and educators and counselors and like that. Out of that work came the thought and the realization that I describe in Do What You Love called vocational integration, and I'll speak with you about that a little bit tonight. But I thought the way I would like to approach my subject tonight is to divide it into three, roughly three parts. I thought I'd speak with you for about an hour, and uh, if you're still with me, um, perhaps we could try a, an exercise or two at the tail end of that time. And then I would like to spend the bulk of the rest of the time, for however long it would take, uh, maybe another half hour to an hour, 45 minutes, something like that, answering your questions. So if something strikes you as I'm talking, feel free to make a note and, and do uh, bring that up as we move along towards the uh, end of the evening. Now I should say that when I first began doing a talk like this for groups such as yours, a much smaller though I would, I'm going to say, you know, by the way, I have to say, Kathy is the one that was charged with the responsibility of putting all of this together. And um, I have to say, this is, a, this is a fantastic job of logistics and uh, just the place itself. So thank you very much. Yeah. So when I first began talking about this theme, I would primarily concentrate on the topic of right livelihood. And then people would say in the question and answer, well, that's all well and good, but what about self-esteem? You know, doesn't self-esteem make a great deal of difference as to whether you feel free enough to go into your vocation or this thing that you call right livelihood? So I began to add a little bit of information about self-esteem. And then in the question and answer, people would say, yeah, it's all well and good, Marcia, self-esteem and right livelihood, but what about the money? <laughs> so I thought tonight what I would do is concentrate on those three. I will define right livelihood and talk a little bit about what it is in my, uh, in my interpretation. It's not an original term with me. It was coined by the Buddha uh, as, a, as a way of using the task to gain enlightenment and serve, as I understand it. And I've extrapolated that a little bit to our contemporary uh, culture. Uh, then I'll talk a little bit about self-esteem and why it occurs to me through observation and also research that with high self-esteem it's easier to know what we want and to pursue it in a way that is successful. And by successful, I don't mean uh, the People magazine, uh, lives of the rich and famous type of success. I'm speaking about fulfilling, satisfying work that you can do for a lifetime and not be bored, that kind of work. And finally, I thought I would mention a few thoughts about money and why it occurs to me, again, from observation and interviews on, on this topic, that some people seem to have an easier time pulling the money in when they begin their vocation, when they begin their work. Um, as a way of getting us together on this, I thought I would begin with a concept by an author who now has become a friend. His name is John Cantwell Kiley, and he wrote a book several years ago. It's out of print now, but your library would have it. It's called Self-Rescue. It's a marvelous book that John wrote, I believe after he had suffered a loss, I think his brother, it was a personal loss. Um, introduction by William Buckley, it's a first-rate book. And he says in that book that we human beings have essentially two parts that are fighting against one another. 
the one part he calls the part that knows. And he says that the part that knows is that in us that is already whole. It is the part of us that is royal, a king or a queen. And this part knows everything that we need. But then he says there's another part, and he calls this the part that drags. <laughs> and the part that drags is the part that thinks about something for 20 or 30 years before taking action on it. <laughs> I see you also have your part that drags. <laughs> so I thought before uh, going into the right livelihood, I would ask you the right livelihood topic. I would ask you to just sit for 30 seconds and try to remember or get a feel for or connect with the part in you that is the part that knows. Because that's really the part that I would like to talk to tonight. And the part that drags, if you'll just, just put it on hold for a while. You don't have to get rid of it, but just put it aside. So if you just do that little mental gymnastics, about 30 seconds. So then, for the part that knows, if I can define right livelihood as the type of work that you can do, as I say, for a life. And if not a work, it is an attitude. So what I'm saying with right livelihood, especially in the book, Do What You Love, is that we have a wide band of possibilities. At the very minimum, it is a way of approaching every task that we do. And here I would lean very heavily on the, on the Buddhist approach of being mindful and being disciplined. And the, and the Judeo-Christian idea of putting love into your activity so that you can serve one another. So they're very similar ideas. And this has nothing to do with a career. This is essentially a posture. Doing what you love was not meant to imply that you do what you feel like doing or that you do what you want to do. There's too much discipline involved in that. It does, though, mean doing work that will, like a, like a fine wine, get better as you do it more. But if you don't have that work, if you don't know what that work is, and I'll speak to that in just a minute, it also means taking what has been given to you and doing it in a way that elevates you and the person that receives the service or the product or the hobby. So there's, a, there's an integrity to the function. And you're going to hear me say tonight in one way or another, and I've, I've tried to say, that, th say this in, in my life's work, that success is not really about money. Success is about functioning effectively, excellently, and being a competent uh, person at what we do. It's the old sense of being a craftsman, a craftsperson, if you prefer. So no, what are, no matter what we're doing, law, carpentry, homemaking, pottery, apple picking, I have people in the books that I've interviewed in all of these disciplines, what we try to do is to be the best compared to our best. Not to be better than the other guy, but to be good at what we do so that the person that's getting what we have to give gets our best at the moment. All right. So it's an attitude. It's also a particular job for some people. Now, I said I would address that. If you look at children, what you see, and I'd like to talk for a minute about that, because I do tend to see things through this human development filter, given that my background is human development. If you look at the young child that is a protege, music is usually the first protege type that presents itself in the family. When you have a, when you have a child in a family or in a community that is gifted in music, you see that the talent surfaces so that the parents begin to say, undeniably, we've got something here. 
and we have got to nurture this child. And maybe you had experience in your family or your neighborhood where you knew a gifted child. That's on one side of the spectrum. That's the high side. Let's say we've got a scale of 0 to 10, 10 being high. The, the protege is the one, and adults also are, can be protégés. They just can bloom late. But that is the one that feels this sense, this desire to do a particular work. Okay, that's on this side. Over here, we have the person that hasn't got a clue. It's just, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. You know, why am I working anyway? And then in the middle, what you have is all of the gradations in between. And I thought what I would suggest to you tonight is that my impression is that everyone is talented. Everyone is not a gifted genius, but everyone is talented at something. You, you cannot look at a group of children who are healthy, who feel good about themselves, and not see that. Not everyone is willing to develop that talent the way, the way it asks. We don't always have the courage or the strength or the maturity. And believe me, that's what it takes. It's not a quick fix. If you're looking for that, this is not the discipline or the concept for you to follow. It's too difficult. It asks too much. It asks for everything that you have to give. And what it gives you is yourself. It has the right livelihood idea or concept or notion says that in our work we see the whole world. So it's a very, it's a global phenomenon in terms of a concept. Now in the middle of this, I know exactly what I want to do, and this place I haven't got a clue what I want to do, there's a large body of people for a variety of reasons, which we're going to talk about tonight a little bit, who know that there's something else, who feel a dissatisfaction. I think it was Emerson that called it the divine dissatisfaction or divine discontent. It was either Emerson or Thoreau, one of those two. And they feel this discontent, but they don't know what it's about. Or they say to themselves, you shouldn't feel that way. All right. Now, I want to read a letter. And it's a letter from a man who represents this middle ground. And I thought what I would do is begin with the letter. And before I read this, I want to say that my work is not meant to be a prod to create a need where there's no problem. If it's not broken, don't think there's something wrong. You know, tap into your sense of satisfaction because sometimes you don't have to go to the other side of the street to get that thing that you want. It's right in your home, you know, that concept, the grass is not always greener. But here's a letter from someone who does feel this sense, and you can see that he, he knows something's wrong. Uh, Dear Marsha, I've just finished your book, etc., etc. Uh, I think it's time I did something about my work situation. My effort to change it, or my lack of constructive effort, has been pathetic, and it's time I got some outside help. I'm a 44-year-old Englishman with a philosophy degree and a psychology degree, and I've been driving for one of the Bay Area companies for two years. Then he says, see what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> now this last line, as funny as it is, is what the psychiatrist Eric Byrne, who was the father of transactional analysis, he called this gallows humor. This is the joker that says to us, go ahead and have another drink when we've had too many. This is the joker, and that is what uh, Byrne called him, called him Jedder, I think, and he called him a joker and said it was the part of us that, here we have another part, uh, that kids us or kids the other about our pain. But this man knows that he's got some pain. So this is an example of what I'm suggesting is out in our culture, probably the world, but it's more pronounced in the United States because we have 
a tremendously high degree of affluence, even if everyone doesn't have that, we, are, we have images painted for us that more should be coming. Or we have felt a certain satisfaction at one level, according to that needs hierarchy, and now we are discontent for another. So for some reason, there's a revolution going on in this country. It's probably the revolution that um, uh, this um, priest, Dominican priest, said would be without Marx or Jesus. Um, I can't think of his name right now. It'll probably come back later. But he said that the next revolution, and he was writing about 15 years ago, would come in the United States. It would start here, it would be worldwide, and it would be without Marx or Jesus. It would be a revolution of consciousness. And I do believe that that is part of the stimulus for your interest in this topic, and probably uh, part of the stimulus that caused me to be interested in it as well. Well, this is Marcia Zinatar thanking you for listening to this short excerpt of a much, much longer public talk. And the entire talk will be on my website, marciasinatar.com, under the heading Professional Forum, and the drop-down should direct you to the audio section. could be under Leadership, I'm not sure. So I thank you for checking back to the website to see how our plan is unfolding. We're working as hard as we can to get this ready, but it's taking a little time, as you can imagine. Thank you so much.